Today's guest is Jenny Saraswati of Jenny Media. This is a podcast episode about podcasting, but it's also about the journey of Jenny and how she went from Sri Lanka to Australia to Brooklyn, how she started a podcasting agency, how she transitioned from radio to podcasting before launching that agency, what the future of podcasting may look like in conjunction with AI, new channels and platforms that have opened up in podcasting. There's a lot of good stuff in this conversation. And best of all, you're going to be speaking to someone who's constantly interfacing with people who want to start shows. If you as a business owner or entrepreneur, or just as one of our listeners, has ever considered podcasting, or considered podcasting in the sense of using it as a medium, this is the kind of episode you're going to want to listen to. Just so happens you also get to learn about somebody else's entrepreneurial journey as well, transitioning from an employee to a CEO. This is an episode you don't want to miss and one you want to dive in all the way on. So without further ado, Jenny Saraswati of Jenny Media. Jenny, I was just telling you that I rarely get the chance to do this, but talking about podcasting on a podcast, this is a rare treat. <clears throat> so to get things started, I think first, I'd like to ask you about your first experience with a podcast in general. Do you remember where you were or what you were doing when you first came across the idea of podcasting as a medium? Gosh, this is a trip down memory lane for me, Philip. I love that you said that it's rare for you to talk about a podcast on a podcast. It's kind of like a babushka doll, right? Like you just open up more and little <laughs> dolls come out. Inception. Um, exactly, <laughs> inception. Um, so my first experience podcasting was actually quite by accident. So um, my background's in radio. So in Australia, I had an FM morning show for 10 years on and off. And as a consequence of being an FM radio host, you were made into a podcaster. So my experience of podcasting, first experience was I was in Melbourne, Australia, um, in the City Hub at, in a place called Burke Street. It was level nine. We had a view of the, the city of Melbourne, which is a lot smaller than the city I live in now. And um, yeah, we recorded all these podcasts interviewing different people. Um, I can't remember the very first podcast episode I put out, but I, I remember one day I woke up and our program director's like, because I literally did wake up because we did morning radio. And she's like, yo you know, your podcast is doing really well. You're great work team. And we're like, we didn't know we had a podcast, but great. So that was my first podcast. Very unconscious experience, but was all the more enjoy enjoyable when I found out I was actually a podcaster. <laughs> you know what? This brings up a really great point. The difference between radio and podcasting. Is there a difference? Do you see that? I don't have any radio experience. I always wanted to be on radio, actually. For some reason, it never really panned out for me. But I'd love to know if there is a difference between how you approach your presence on the mic, things of that nature, um, the kinds of things that you talk about. You know, what does that look like for you in your world? You having that experience? Sure, that's a great question, Philip. So when I was doing radio, and particularly this has been my experience, when it's a live show, especially right, you've got the timeliness element of it because when you're doing a live morning show, which is like a news broadcast, essentially. You know, the, the weather reports, the traffic reports, it's all very up to date. So there is a sense of this is time sensitive um, approach to it. However, the content that you put on there, like the interviews that you have with certain guests, you know, you might do certain segments, they don't necessarily have a time sensitive element associated with it. So I think the way that I would see podcasting, especially when it started out, is like on demand radio right? It was like very much like on-demand TV. If you missed your favorite TV show, you could catch it the next day. Or you didn't have to be in front of the TV at 7.30 p.m. on a Monday night to just miss that show. Otherwise, you miss it entirely and you have to wait for VHS. So I kind of see podcasting, it's evolved a lot since. But when it started out, especially for me, my experience of it was seeing it as like an on-demand radio. You can access your favorite shows and the interviews of your favorite guests in your own time. So I think the autonomous part of podcasting is what separates it from uh, radio. That's super cool. It makes me drive a connection between sort of going live on a social media platform, similar to what radio may, must have felt like, except obviously production value is way higher in terms of <laughs> what's actually being put out. And that's the other thing, yeah. okay? Uh, uh, which brings me to uh, sort of the, the work that you're doing, right? So you started in, if correct me if I'm wrong, you're an agency that actually produces and creates podcasts for some of Fortune 5,000 brands, Fortune 500 brands. What, what is that Correct. exactly? Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. So we create, so we're an in-house 
Ginny Media is an in-house uh, in-house production podcast house. Uh, we do produce a Fortune 500 company podcast, branded podcasts, and also podcasts for small to medium entrepreneurs. So that's kind of our niche of what we do and operate on. Yeah. And so speaking of production quality, like I, when I was first starting out, how I even got to where I am, I did something very similar. Uh, I couldn't keep it rolling. I just didn't find the clientele. I wasn't narrowed in. I think uh, it makes a lot of sense, like having the background that you had, you know, the people who knew about you, the things that were working out. Do you find that there was ever a discussion about uh, a, a delta, let's say a difference between the expectation and what kind of quality a client may want to put out versus what kind of production they're actually willing to pay for and do. Because that becomes the valley. That was one of the biggest things I ran into. People wanted to be how I built this NPR, but then they wanted to put out one episode every week, not pay a lot for production, not have any notes or ideas on where they want things to go, call you a producer, but really just want you to edit the audio really quickly and put it out. Regardless, These are some of the things that I kept coming across. Was that your experience? I think... When podcasting started, so when I started the agency back in 2018, officially, when I stopped it being my side hustle and made it my main main gig, the because podcasting was relatively new, and I say new very loosely in terms sure. of new for people who thought it was an acceptable <laughs> form of creating content, right? Yeah. So people were still learning. So, you know, pre-2020, um, Philip, a lot of people, even now, we're recording a podcast on Zoom, right? There weren't there wasn't a variety of platforms to record on to allow you a certain quality level. Right now, there's platforms like Riverside, Squadcast, all these ones uh, aside from Zoom that allow you to record podcasts in audio and video. So there was a big education element and I still find that to be the case. But I find that with the clientele that we have, so we have everybody from Fortune 500s to you know small to medium business owners who are like really in the trenches of their business and podcasting is like a content medium for them to put out content about their business, okay? So there's certain levels of skill sets and budgets. And I find that um, when it comes to the budget question, um, sometimes it's aligned with like, hey, I just want you guys to do everything for me. Um, And now that we have so many more podcasts than we did back five, six years ago, there's different levels of quality, right? Um, And people are like, I want to strive for that North Star of, say, Diary of a CEO-esque, then I'm yeah. like, you do realize Stephen Bartlett spent 40,000 British pounds on his studio. And they're like, what? So it's there is an education element to answer your question, Philip, that I do feel that um, needs to be shared with clientele so they can actually see that it's not as easy as it seems. And this takes time and a team and production and a significant investment. Some clients are pretty open to it. They have the budgets to, to think that way. And then some clients are like, no, I'm happy with just this being a content medium for me. And then we talk about budget. So I find that it's constantly an educational process that even though that may be the North Star, this is where we can get to your, the best possible quality that you can given your budget restrictions, time, equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of like a, I guess, a ceiling for both caps. It just depends on the client where they want that ceiling to be. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you talked about uh, you talked about the idea of like going from side hustle to main gig. What was yeah. that transition like for you? I find in my life that the things that happen are highly accidental for me. So I just stumble into, oh, okay, I run a business now. What does that look like? Whereas before, you know, I was being managed or I had a manager to report to. I guess for me, the transition from, you know, employee to CEO, it was very gradual. And I think, um, you know, I'm still learning every day as a business owner, as a CEO, you know, I have coaches and, and mentors that I turn to for advice now. But when I originally started, you know, when you're an employee, you have kind of one direct report, right? That manager sets the expectations. You only really have to manage up. And when I mean manage up is by like, if your manager says, this is what I need you to complete today, please have it done by this time. If you do it exactly how the manager expects it to be done, literally you fly under the radar and your job is cruisy. I mean, that's a very blanket way of me saying that, but that was my experience of my last full-time job. Like my manager said, this is the work I need you to complete by your shift ends. Please do it. I would do it. And then sometimes I'd ask for more. So this way I knew my manager would leave me alone. So that's kind of how I managed my manager as an employee. It's like, 
what can I do? So my manager leaves me alone, right? So that typically translated to do your work and do a little bit more when you could. I've kind of always been that way. But then when I transitioned to CEO, there was a learning curve for me that I had to understand that when you work for a company, not everybody is going to care as much as you care about your own company, right? But the question that you need to ask and learn is, do they care the appropriate amount to keep your business running the way that you needed to run? And that was a big learning curve for me because now going from employee where I was managing up, I was managing down, but also managing up with my clients. So I had to answer to kind of two sets of people and I felt myself as a middle person. So it's kind of like this balancing act of harmony. Like how can I keep things harmonious in the team? How can I keep things harmonious for my clients? So that was another skill set I had to learn. And I'm still learning that too, because you know juggling expectations of people can be quite difficult, especially if you're a company dispersed around 16 different locations and you have a lot of clients with a lot of timelines and marketing budgets and marketing calendars. So it's a constant process, Philip, I think. And um, I think you it's a process that needs to have support and resources around it. You can't go into the big wide world of entrepreneurship on your own. <laughs> what was the first obstacle you faced where it made you realize CEO just hits a little different. Leading a team just hits a little different when all the risk is on you and you're the one that has to figure this out. And maybe you can rely on your team, but who on your team? And sort of when you start stepping into that room, uh, I'm speaking metaphorically here, but when you step into that room and you realize I'm really doing this, what, what was that moment for you? It was a moment I was in my apartment in Brooklyn. So I just moved from Australia to Brooklyn. And the rude awakening I had moving from Australia to Brooklyn was just how bloody expensive rent is in New York. (laughs) So I was like, oh my God, I am doing this. So that was kind of the first, I guess, first little jab. And then the second jab was I was in my uh, room that I had been renting out in this apartment and I was thinking, okay, so this is how much I have to pay for rent. This is how much I need to survive, to eat, to live comfortably in New York. And now I bought on a team. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, now you've got to be responsible for how other people eat, how other people pay rent. Like, what are you doing? I thought, you are crazy. Because as I said to you before, I've been stumbling into what I've, I've just been accidentally falling into entrepreneurship. I didn't really have a big epiphany that, oh, I need to do this, at least not consciously anyway. But that moment when I had that quiet moment in my apartment, in my room in Brooklyn, I was like, oh gosh, this is really happening. And then I'm like, I've got to think about how many more clients do I need to think? How many more resources do I need? Like, do I need to build out teams? And then I started getting ahead of myself. But in that moment, I realized, oh, this is actually really exciting because now I have full control of how I design my day, how much I want to work and what it's going to take. And I knew that, you know, my first few years of entrepreneurship, it would require me working a considerable amount of time. But now I have the luxury of having systems processes and an awesome team in place to help me carry that. So I can clock off at a decent hour and not have too many gray hairs by the end of the day. So that was that moment, Philip, when I was in my apartment, when I realized, oh, this is really happening and that I'm a little crazy. So <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah, The experience of like, wow, I have a lot more bills than I used to and I'm paying them. Yeah. But what am I doing? It's it sounds like uh, one of those things where it's like I've moved forward for sure, yeah. but now it's even scarier because now you're higher, you have more to lose than you did before. Yeah. How do you handle that anxiety? Are there any things that you do? Do you rely on your mentors or what is it? So one thing being an immigrant, so I was born in Sri Lanka, raised in Australia. My family are big on saving. I sometimes don't know what they're saving for. I'm like, what are you actually <laughs> saving for? It's like in case this, I'm like, but we've been doing this for a while and what are you actually saving for? So that's another podcast for another time. But (laughs) I think I've always had that in the back of my mind, even though the path I've taken has been slightly less traditional than what I think someone from Sri Lanka as a woman in in my time would have done. Um, I Even my business mentor said, make sure you have enough savings in your personal account, in your business account, should there be a time you need to fork out money. So thankfully... I've been trained and that's something I had to learn because naturally for me, you know, my mother was a bank manager. My sister is a bank manager. They're great with money and books. I, for some reason, that gene missed me. Like it was like, oh, Ginny's conceived. Oh, we're not going to give her that gene. We'll give her other 
fun qualities, but not that math one. But I had to learn that, especially when I started my business, I'm like, okay, I need to save in case, like, how can I pay rent? How can I pay this? But the anxiety of, um, you know, I always do think what is, I ask myself, what's the worst thing that could happen for you as a business owner? And obviously the worst thing that could happen is you have to stop running your business. And what would that mean for me? That would mean I'd have to go back to full-time work, going back to employee, having a manager. And I've done that before. And yes, it wasn't my favorite thing in the world to do. Like I wouldn't be singing. These are a few of my favorite things about my job, but I've done it before and it's okay. And I can do it again. And I'd probably start another business. So I think for me, that's what kind of shakes off the anxiety and the pressure. Like I am completely comfortable with going back to where I was. Um, hopefully I don't have to, but I'm completely comfortable going there. And I'm also completely comfortable um, dealing with anyone's opinions about that too, because I know the path that I've walked and I'm completely comfortable with any kind of judgments that come my way. It's just eliminating that noise of that fear of what will people think. That's, I think that's the part that is a constant battle. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I kind of eliminate that anxiety. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, knowing that, like I'm committed to making this work if it means that it's two steps back, one step forward or two steps back, four steps forward, whatever it mm -hmm. looks like. I know this is the direction I'm going in. So anything that happens in between all that is just part of the process. And yeah, surrendering to that is definitely important because I mean, for someone as neurotic as me, I may not come across that way, but I do try to swim against the stream pretty much every day. So yeah. to hear to hear someone, you know, especially someone that I, I can really relate to in terms of like what you're trying to do and accomplish. Uh, I, it's good to hear that, you know, and, and I'm sure many other podcasters, uh, if they get the chance to, to hear this, you know, um, they'd be feeling the same way. And I know for a fact, given that I own, I've only really interviewed like CEOs and entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of them face these kinds of things, right? The, yeah. I've got two weeks of cash flow left and I've got a lot that I need to pay. What yeah. am I going to do? You know, those anxieties are real and only people who are in that circumstance, which is why I was drilling in so deep to that, can really relate to that. And it's cool to hear how a leader views the path that lay before them, which is, yeah. okay, this, this is what it's going to be. And it's not always going to be moving forward, but I'm prepared yeah. for that. And that, yeah. I think, is super cool because you're entrenched in your commitment to where you're going. And that seems to be a truly defining quality of how to get anything that you want in life. Uh, just if I were to parlay what I'm hearing from you with people that I've interviewed, it really is, there's no magic science, no nothing. It's no. just that sheer commitment and being okay with not always being ahead. And it's like you said, like, I might have to go back, but it's not forever. And that exactly. I think is huge. So then why don't you talk to me about some of your favorite like moments producing shows because with 5,000 new podcasts being uploaded every day and everyone trying to do something, I mean, it pretty much has all been done. Do you find yourself surprised still when people start talking about show concepts and things of that nature? I find myself quietly surprised and also like excited too because you're right, there's 5,000 shows being uploaded and it could be anyone from talking about the best dog collars in the world <laughs> to like the best grooming tips for dogs. I just love that, you know, audio is at a point now where like, again, it's when on-demand TV started, it was like, like, like those main shows that were getting kind of that attention, right? But now there's all the reality TV shows came out, but now with podcasting, you know, true crimes obviously a hit, you know, business podcasts are a hit. Um, there are all these things that you can podcast on. But what I'm quietly surprised by is the way that brands are aligning with content and it's and how quickly they're adapting to the factors. Typically when podcasts started, you know, five, six years ago, um, when people were really getting into it and starting to realize again it was a great medium to connect with their consumer. It's like, oh, let's do a podcast about a product that we have. And then they quickly realize, oh, what we're actually doing is producing a 30-minute advertisement. And that's very hard to get people to engage with when they're being sold to for 30 minutes, right? But now I love the facts that brands are a little bit more savvy to be like, no, no, let's not talk about our product. Let's talk about the impact of a certain issue that we're, um, you know, helping with in civilization. Um, so recently, I had the honor of working with The Skim on a project that they had with Whirlpool called Breaking the Cycle. 
So Whirlpool were sending, you know, washers and dryers to schools to help uh, tackle the issue of absenteeism in schools because one of the reasons why children were absent from schools was because they didn't have clean clothes. So Whirlpool kind of did this community service for them and, you know, gave them washers and dryers and they're testing this out across the country. So I thought that was really cool. But the podcast wasn't just about the products. It was about, you know, the issue of absenteeism, how this actually impacts children's growth, like their growth um, emotionally, their growth intellectually, how this impacts the teachers, um, how, and how this kind of impacts essentially our future, right? Because the kids in school at the moment, they're going to be our future. When we're boomers, Philip, they're going to be paying taxes to help keep us around. So it's a really important issue. And I think um, I'm really, really quietly surprised and even more surprised um, at times that they are becoming more savvy about messaging and about really tackling the actual issue as opposed to, here's my product and here's how fabulous it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, trying to carry over the old school or the tried and true applications of how they used to market is definitely it's it's exciting to hear that more and more brands are uh, embracing the new way of marketing, which is no marketing at all. Just mm. speaking about real impact and applications. I, I love hearing that, that, that you're yeah. sharing that with me because I, that is something that often catches me by surprise is how, how many people still think even use of social media with podcasting, right? It's just like, hey, look at me, listen to me. And it de- it defeats your purpose. That how do you get around or do you face any resistance still from people that you may be potentially working with, prospecting, et cetera? Uh, and you don't need to throw anybody under the bus or whatever by throwing names or anything. What I'm saying is like, do you still find that there's still some resistance and they're like, no, we want to do it this way? Or is it really now something that you don't really see anymore and everyone really is in line with the new way of storytelling? I get kind of typically in my field, I get two kind of clients, one who are like, Ginny, we completely trust you and your team. Let's go with what we want. And then we kind of have a collaborative process where they're like, okay, I want it this way. What do you think? It's more like collaborative, but there's pretty much, they rely on my and my team's expertise to to create the grand product. And then there are the odd clients who are like, well, we want to do it this way. We've always been doing it this way, which is cool. I think the... The biggest challenge I find is the expectation of how well the show is going to do um, and how yeah. it's going to bring in monetization. Monetization is probably the biggest thing that comes into it. And I think what it's, it's kind of like a double-ended sword because in one way, a podcast, again, as I mentioned, is like a content stream for their or a content machine for their business or brand or whatever it might be. And the other way, yes, it does have potential to monetize, but there's many ways to monetize now, right? You can put ads in there. You can do like sponsored content. You could do a branded audio series. There's so many ways that podcasts could monetize. But I think the biggest expectation uh, for me to kind of manage is, oh, I don't have 5 million downloads in a year. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, some people do get 5 million downloads a year. We have a client who gets a million a year, but it's... The difference is the way that they've marketed, how long they've been doing it, how long they've been building their brand. There's different kind of facets to to that too. So for me, it's managing the expectations of the person and also managing like, hey, I'm actually letting you know you're doing well. You're charting across the world. You're doing really well. Like the numbers may not reflect the success that you actually want, but let's pause for a minute and let like let it be known. You're actually one of the top podcasts in these countries. That's an achievement um, and a selling point. So it's it's that point for me: monetization and expectation of numbers. Yeah, similar to uh, even a couple of gigs I did in the past with social media. Right, where are my followers? So I it, it, vanity metrics, if you will, that have nothing to yeah. do with like where your growth is actually going, and yeah. being able to look at the data and determine like who is it that is embracing what I'm doing and what does that mean? You know, am I landing with the right people? All of those things really building towards that, which are sort of should be applied across whatever vertical someone is in. And yet the expectation is totally misaligned quite often. Why didn't I go viral? And why do so many people want to go viral? It's the question of like, it's this, It's like scaling the unscalable, really, Philip, when you think about it. It's like everybody's aiming for vi- virality. And yes, virality does have its perks. But then if you look at what Taylor Swift does. Now, 
I had the honor and lost my hearing partially when I went to a Taylor Swift concert this year. But wow. you know, every single person in that stadium is a diehard fan. Now, Taylor Swift, she has millions of followers, makes millions of dollars. But the fact that she takes time out of her schedule to go to her fans' weddings, to their birthday parties, to drop off presents, there's no quantifiable um, value or ROI for her to do that. But the depth she's creating in her fan base, the fact that fans look at that and are like, wow, that's our girl and she does this. The loyalty and repeat customers, she's got their wallet for life. You know, yeah. it's not just, she's not thinking about that one transaction. She's thinking about every concert she's doing from now until she retires, every single song she puts out from now until she retires. It's that constant, hey, I've got a really deep, diehard feeling for this person. So I think you talk about vanity metrics and I think people are striving for that. But what they are not looking at is, to your point, the depth. Who are we targeting? How loyal are they? How are we serving them? How do we really deepen our connection with that customer or person? That's what we need to start looking at. Yeah, when I was helping people do this, the nature of this work and launch and and, and yeah. record and yeah. produce, they said, this is all great, but honestly, like unless you can help us really like market it and explode this, maybe it's not worth investing in. I think someone said, you know, if it was worth starting and you had an impact that you wanted yeah. to have and this and that, and then because four or five episodes in, it's not exploding, that expectation yeah. is crazy because these are entrepreneurs that I was working with who had a business running at least $1.2 million in annual revenue and all the approaches they took to grow that business. And then they, they step out of their medium and suddenly they're acting like anyone else who has never yeah. tried to grow something. It's then you add to that discoverability, which I think is starting to sort of fade out in terms of uh, being harder and harder to be discovered. I think, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Like there are channels now, like when Stitcher closed, I think, and I don't want to stray too far in case people don't know what Stitcher is, but when Stitcher closed, it looked like good pods came into the picture to try to pick up that slack. But are there any favorite like uh, uh, distributors or, or or players that you yourself find really have taken into consideration what podcasters want? The right type of uh, hero image, the player looks awesome. It, it encourages the next episode, things of that nature. I think um, Good Pods is a really interesting one that you brought up there, Philip, because I think what Good Pods has done so well that other platforms haven't been able to do so well is the interactivity community aspect of podcasting, right? So you can sign up for a Good Pods account. It's essentially like another player like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple. But not only do you get you know, a different app to distribute your podcast on, you actually get a whole community interacting communicating, talking about podcasting. Now, the other apps don't allow that. So we don't have like a Twitter for podcasting, but Good Pods essentially is becoming that water cooler. So I think they're doing really well on that community aspect of, you know, podcasting and, you know, talking about and getting people to trend. And the really cool thing is like, I can go on Good Pods and make a list for top entrepreneurial podcasts, put in my recommendations. And then other people on my feed be like, oh, Ginny's listening to this. So it's a new way of discoverability. Spotify obviously is the other sleeping giant that we, you know, obviously they made cuts this year, but they were thinking well in terms of, hey, we want to be the number one audio platform in the world. So they had their, you know, they're putting audiobooks in, they had podcasts, they were a music platform. They were doing really well, I think, in terms of thinking about that sort of stuff. And also in the back end, you know, buying Megaphone. Megaphone, I think, is one of the best hosting platforms out there for a podcaster, especially if you're a brand or business, because it's so user-friendly. The player is really good looking. Um, and it's also, I say that really bad. The player is really, really pretty. And it's also very easy to use on the back end, look at metrics. Um, so I think Spotify needs to be in that discussion, even though they've made cuts significantly. But those two players, I'm curious to know what Spotify's next wave is, what they plan on doing now that they've kind of cut back on the the audio spend and the boom and the acquisitions. But um, Good Pods and Spotify for me, they're the two platforms I would watch. It's <laughs> funny. I, I, I am exactly aligned with that. That is yeah. that is accurate. There's yeah. just something about the way they approach that. Now, because there are entrepreneurs who mostly listen to this show and because of your experience, I think you are uniquely qualified to answer this, being someone who produces that many shows and is running an entire agency doing this. 
What are some things that you'd love to see business podcasters do uh, in general or business owners who go as guests on shows that they yeah. really should be looking at and considering uh, given your expertise? Sure. So I actually, funny that you mentioned this, Philip, because yesterday on my kind of pod, podcast mastermind call with a few of my clients, we were talking through how to make like the perfect media kit for you to pitch your show or pitch yourself to be on a show. And you really got to hone it down to, and this can be quite scary because obviously any entrepreneur, given what product or service you might offer, you want to remain relevant. You want to remain the expert in that field. And you want to obviously put out good and regular content, whether it be you hosting on shows or guesting on shows or whatever it might be. But I think the important thing is to really continually look at um, what you're an expert in, right? Really look at the six key points. So for example, if we were going to sit down and you're running a car business, what are the six key points or six topics that you can continually talk about on shows, but always keep it contextual and fresh to that particular audience? Um, and that sounds so simple, but I think it's so important that we keep revisiting those points because as an entrepreneur, things change and move, markets move, people change, consumers change. So how does your expertise, your business, um, the way of your workflow, how does that change to adapt? So I think continually focus and hone in on what your expert topics are and even think about what are the kind of questions people are going to want to know from me? Because that essentially, if you have that down and you consistently check those things, that effectively is your content pipeline, right? You can turn that into blogs. You can turn that into podcasts. You can turn that into vlogs. Um, but you keep recycling that and you keep refining that. It's just a way to keep yourself accountable that you're doing your due diligence as a business owner, that you're really, you know, quarantining your content for want of a better word and also remaining relevant. It's a really good hack to continually revisit what are the six things that are really important that I'm addressing in my life, in my industry, in my business right now? Um, I would start there. That's a really good first step, I would say, in podcasting too. I love that because it's uh, necessitating that someone actually be a subject matter expert in their industry. Right? Exactly. That's Rather something. than saying I am and not doing it, right? <laughs> because industries change. And if you're yeah. not staying up to date with what's going on, for example, if I was still talking about Stitcher, when everyone knows that it closed yeah. down and I'm like, yeah, that's such a great platform. It's like, what is a great platform, right? You know, there are yeah. new platforms. What do those new platforms exactly. look like? Why are these different? All those things matter. Mm -hmm. And someone having subject matter expertise should also have subject matter opinions, right? Exactly. And exactly. It's just awesome to hear. Uh, then again, I mean, we're we're more aligned probably than misaligned in terms yeah. of what we're trying to do. So what do you want to see in podcasting as things move forward? I mean, you're looking at AI. I think Joe yeah. Rogan was one of the first people to put together an AI episode. And personally, I find that the inflections aren't there yet in the voices. They're good. They're great yeah. mimics of the actual voices. Yeah. And I do believe that it will eventually get pretty, pretty... Good to the point where it's uh, that's the word I'm looking for compelling enough that people would listen to it. I, people are already making YouTube videos in that fashion, but yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, your experiences on it. Do you find that it's going to be compelling enough that it may step in, or is podcasting truly the art of human? <laughs> I actually I wrote a couple of articles about this, like you know, podcasting in AI versus the human touch. What I really love about podcasting and audio media in general is that intimacy factor. The fact that you are one-on-one, -on -one, you're literally in someone's ear, even someone listening to this show, we're in their ear, right? So the ability to impact genuinely and authentically is higher than any other medium, right? Because we are, you don't really let that people, many people close to your ear, do you, Philip? Like, it's only a very few people that you do. So that part of me, I think AI <laughs> is not going to achieve that level of intimacy. Now, you mentioned the voice flexions. There's like a plethora of, of issues that that could bring about. And I'm not saying that AI is not, um, AI is a great uh, add-on skill or a great contributor to any kind of business operation. But I think the issue with voices being replicated, you're now eating into a job market of voiceover actors, right? You're now eating into translators. There's like a big job market out there as a, you know, I'm kind of a voiceover actor in my previous, I don't really do it anymore, but there's also people who who lend their voice for money and that sort of stuff. But 
Now you see AI cloning those voices. That becomes, that's some people's IP, right? That becomes there's theft issues there or that sort of thing. But to answer your question, I think AI can do great things for podcasting. I don't think replicating voice is one of them. I think things like the fact that they can transcribe in different languages to make that show more accessible, I think that's brilliant. Um, I think copying other people's voices, for me, that's a little creepy because obviously it just opens up a world of, oh God, Ginny's on the phone talking to the IRS about tax. I'm not on the phone to the IRS talking about tax. There's things in there that I think can get quite scary and dark, as it does with something that's not as regulated as it's booming. But my opinion is in terms of podcasting and AI, I, I would like to see the intimacy keep going with the authentic voices. But AI can contribute to podcasting in other ways, like transcribing show notes, um, picking out the, awesome. the best pieces of content. <laughs> you know, it's those ways AI can. And there are people that will will benefit from that. Like it will, like even my team, they use AI to transcribe and to also write show notes. They work together. But um, so that's kind of the way that I'm I'm seeing things at the moment with AI. <laughs> No, I, I love it. I mean, you're seeing stories of people being called from their family members with voice cloned voices that yeah. are saying things that aren't true. Send me money. You know, uh, I'm being held hostage, whatever the case is. Yeah. It's truly turning dystopian pretty fast without wanting to raise any alarms. But I'm starting to see signs of that. I'm even having people reach out to me on LinkedIn, for example, and saying, I'd love to buy out episodes of your podcast to train my model. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't even write back. I'm just thinking of like that's not something I want to do. Yeah, there's a reason why SAG after and all of them, you know, went on strike. I actually remember uh, being invited to I think it was Space Jam two, yeah, you know, with LeBron James to be an extra on it or whatever. And they had me step into a machine. And the thing is, I remember signing some stuff. I thought it was just like release forms, you know, because when you're on film, they have yeah. to sign release forms. Yeah. But then they 3D scanned me. Uh, so that they didn't need me anymore for that whole thing. And so this was just before, uh, I want to say maybe a year before the strikes started to happen or whenever Space Jam right. 2 was coming out. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself like, wait a minute, this is starting to get crazy because I understand how it impacts the bottom line and maximizes profits, right? Uh, there's a great book called The Technology Trap that I was reading and it talks about the time when someone used to go around and light like with, you know, oil and candles and yeah. fire and what have you, all the street lamps. Yeah. And then electricity hit. Yeah. And it was a huge disruption and many people rioted and it was, it was yeah. pretty bad, you know? Yeah. Like you were talking about with uh, people who depend, who loan their voice uh, and have that, that experience and that's how they make their money and now that's being disrupted. And I interviewed yeah. somebody yesterday who uh, was on the team for Nelson Mandela for, you know, strategic, like, political, you know, um, movements and strategies. And he started talking about AI and he he said something, it was pretty striking. He said, if a machine can replace you, then we shouldn't have humans doing that. And under the spirit, he wasn't talking about in the context we're talking about now, right? With, But he made some valid points. And and I I follow that up with the idea of like a you know, Amazon saying that soon they'll have workers that are just robots in the warehouses because they can work with the lights off kind of situation. So in that instance, I think I understand what you're saying. But when AI starts to try to clone human voices and faces, yeah. right, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that that stuff is like, well, that's what else is there left for humans to do, right? At that point. Yeah. And you disrupt the economy, forget about it. I, I, exactly. Everyone's excited about it. I love the tools. I, I totally yeah. am excited. It's just... Yeah. I, I'm happy to hear that you yourself are also standing behind and saying, yeah, I don't know if that's going to be a thing that that I'm, I think AI should be a part of because then it becomes disruptive and sort of instead of expansive to exactly. someone's business model, right? Exactly. And then and, it's and like, I, yeah, <laughs> no, go ahead, go totally, ahead. no, I'm totally aligned with you there too, because you touched on a really good point. Like, what is there left for humans to do? Like, how do we actually solve issues? Can robots go and solve world hunger? Why haven't they done that already? Like, what is left for us to do? And obviously there's other factors, you know, the economical factors, like how are we going to keep that economic cycle going if robots are taking our job? Because it relies on us working to contribute to that cycle, right? Money in, money out. It's like, I mean, that's just a drop in the bucket of this topic too, but I totally hear you on that too. And I think also just as an artist, like, I have that kind of creative artistic integrity to be like, there's 
certain things that AI can, like what you said, enhance what we do or contribute to what we do. But to do it all, like we're just going to, we should just create another planet for us to live on then. Can they create another planet for us to live on then? Like things like that. Like what is there left for us to do? <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a platform called HeyGen, I think it is. And uh, they basically have you record like two minutes of you speaking. And then you can just literally use a script. You don't even have to record the videos anymore. You'll be wearing the clothes that you wore when yeah. you did the video. And it basically clones your likeness entirely in under two minutes. Problem is they're charging like $200 a month to use the platform. So let me get this straight. Not only do you have access and rights to the use of my likeness now because you've cloned it, but you're also going to charge 200 something odd dollars a month to be uh, for me, for your hosting needs to run your operation. Yeah. And the list goes on and on and on and on because the perceived value prop that they're giving you as a business is, well, now you don't even have to dress up to record your videos. You just type yeah. a script and it does it. And you could even add an accent to, <laughs> to oh, your videos gosh. if you want. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. <laughs> It's it's tricky, but this is the future we're living in. And I can't wait to see where podcasting is going to go. So uh, we just totally went off on a podcast tangent there. <laughs> I love but it. I, I want to roll out the red carpet for you, Jenny. What do you want people to know about what you're doing right now? And where do you want them to go now that they've had a chance to like get to know you a little bit better? Well, thank you. I'd love to get to know everybody. I think the best thing about podcasting is the connection and the community and the conversations we're able to have, just like this one, like, you know, you and I from different walks of life, different parts of the world, and we've connected on so many topics here. So I'd love to keep the conversation going. You can hit me up at uh, ginnymedia.com. I uh, would love to hear from you entrepreneurs or if you're just really passionate about, you know, voiceover artistry, I, I love anything and anything about um, those topics. So we can, we can talk about that. So ginnymedia.com, you can reach out to me and would love to chat to you there. That's like a pro. And I believe me, I, <laughs> as you know, we do a lot of these, but I, it's <laughs> really cool to hear somebody just know what they're doing. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by. It really was a pleasure. And honestly, you can never have enough allies in podcasting. So I, I'm glad that we're connected. Uh, again, Thanks for stopping by, Jenny. Back at you, Philip. Thanks so much for having me.